this is the fourth week of my winter break over 2017. I'm starting to lose track. So this last week was Christmas and I got to spend some time with family members, which was really nice. And a lot of people got me books for Christmas, which was really nice. So I got On Kish by Odd Nerdrum. Um, and if you're not familiar with Kish's use, or Odd Nerdrum's use of Kish, um, <clears throat> uh, Kish is usually a derogative term to describe painting or drawings or I think probably any visual art or maybe anything in the arts. Um, but Anurjum is using expanding the word kish and talking about how there's art and then there is kish and they're completely different things and should be judged differently. And I can read the, the first page on it where it talks about um, some of Kish qualities. So the Kish painter should not be judged on national, racial, or religious grounds in his depiction of life, but on the basis of timeless qualities. The Kish painter is not protected by the time in which he lives. He strives to represent history's most sublime qualities and should be judged in accordance with these. A work of Kish is either good or bad, and good Kish must not be classified as art. This would be an error of judgment. Kish is not art. Kish refers to the sensual and the timeless. The Kish painter is committed to the eternal, love, death, and the sunrise. Innovation is of no importance, nor is originality. Going in depth is the goal, for in the depiction of nature itself lies an individual expression. Because modernism and art are the same, Kish is the, is, Kish is the savior of talent and devotion. So this book is on Underdrum's philosophies on Kish and I'm excited to read more about it. Um, from what I do know of it, I like I like how he talks about Kish, and um, I like the I like the idea of having the bar raised so high in your own work for painting that you're kind of putting your own work up against all of history's greatest painters, and he's kind of saying that, well, he is saying that in art, it does the opposite of that. And it's more about being original and you're kind of like, if you're the first one to do it, whatever that is, then that's, um, that's a good thing. And that makes good art. Uh, so I do like Kish. I don't know if I go as far as calling myself a Kish painter, but I also don't feel totally comfortable either calling myself an artist either. I just like calling myself a painter, I guess. <laughs> Semantics. Um, and then I got Leonardo da Vinci, The Graphic Works, and this is by Tashin. I have Tashin's other book where it has Leonardo da Vinci's complete paintings and it's the same size as this. So um, super interesting man, Leonardo da Vinci, and so I'm really excited that I have all of his drawings now. So this is the graphic works of Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci. Show you the, oops, the table of contents. And I like how this book is sized too, so I can throw it in my, it's heavy, but I can throw it in my backpack because it's not too, um, too big. I like these these different. I haven't gone through this whole book yet. Well, this is my bookmark, so I'm this far in it. <laughs> but um, different studies of people moving in these quick little sketches are really interesting. I think I've talked about this before, but for composing my own paintings, I've been really liking looking in different um, artists' sketchbooks and how you know I don't know if this is in a painting or not, but how maybe I could use a similar pose and kind of make up my own story around it. And I got Godel Escher Bach 
An Eternal Golden Braid. I've been wanting to read this chunk of a book for a really long time now, so I'm super excited that I've got my hands on it now. Um, this is taught, well, Godel is a mathematician, Escher is a visual artist. He's the one that does um, like the, the hand that's drawing another hand, and he kind of does, uh, at least what I've seen of his work, is a lot of drawings where it kind of messes with your visual perception of things, like staircases going up and down in any which way. And then Bach is the, the composer Bach. So from what I understand of, of reading about this book is that it's, it's kind of a philosophy on math, the visual arts, and music, and how they are intertwined, and um, how they they all compare with each other. So yeah, I'm really excited to, to read this. I am also have been reading this other book, which I got, I got this book about a month ago. It's called The Painter's Secret Geometry, A Study of Composition in Art, and I'm not too far into it. You can see my bookmark there. But um, so I, I read the monumental art chapter, the frame, and geometrical compositions in the Middle Ages. And so that's, I mean, it's called the painter's secret geometry. So it is about geometry and a lot about math and how they're dissecting um, a picture plane and then putting visual points in it, matching up to different parts, talking about the golden ratio and the pentagram. Um, it's interesting, definitely. And so um, I'm more excited. I just got to the chapter, which I haven't started reading yet, but I'm about to read the mu musical consonances, and I'm excited about that, where it talks about putting, um, well, comparing like different ways that you can compare the visual arts and music theory. So I'm excited to read about that. There was one thing that this book was talking about, which I found really interesting and relating it to music. I can find it really quick. Yeah. So having these long, so having these long freezes and how the the figures are placed together with different spacing is, you can see he's comparing that to, to music. Well, more rhythm, musical rhythms. And so that's interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know, I don't really know. I hope I learn more about it with reading um, this book and um, Godel Escher Bach and seeing if it is possible or how other people have try to relate the the visual arts to music theory um because i just find that i that just seems like something interesting to learn about and then finally i got this william mary chase which i'm really getting into his paintings recently it was something that matt said i should be looking into while i'm doing still lifes that um and I, yeah, I'm looking at his work and how he lays down brushstrokes in different and interesting ways, which has a lot of variety, which is what I'm really looking for in other people's paintings to try to study them so I can do, um, see how I can manipulate paint in different ways to have a lot of variety and a lot of interest in the painting. All right, so then William Merritt Chase. Yeah, I flipped through this. I haven't read anything in it yet. I've just been looking through the pictures right now while I'm reading other books. But the um, the quality of the prints are really, really good. This one is uh, a pastel drawing over or on canvas, and I think that looks really interesting. I don't think I've ever I haven't seen a lot of pastel works before, but I don't think I've seen it, people do it on canvas. It's an interesting look. Oh yeah, I was looking at this one since I did garlic before. These are onions. But yeah, this book is really good. You can like, um, the, the reproductions are really, really, 
really nice in it. So going through this book, it looks like it's mostly um, oil paintings, and he has some um, oil painting sketches, and also some um, pastel works in here. So I've been doing a lot of traveling uh, over the holidays, so I spent uh, two days in the studio today and only one day was painting on the Solomon J. Solomon Master Copy and I forgot to take a picture of it. So uh, next week I should be going into the studio a bit more and I'll get some, um, some photos of it so I can show my progress with it. But, so this week what I've been doing is I've been working on more compositions for paintings and I don't know why I've been kind of hesitant, I guess, to um, show them in my videos, but I was thinking about it, I was like, why, why not? Um, I don't know what I'm, what I'm doing, so I'll show what I'm doing to get this one um, painting, but I have this new idea that I'm really, really, really excited about. All right, here's my sketchbook. And so in the early stages with what I've been doing with composing paintings is kind of just a lot of scribbling around like this. So I have this idea of sirens. And usually when I see sirens depicted, it's mostly women, but I really see this being uh, women and men. And they're all sitting on a rock in the seat and they're all facing away except for one person which I picture being a guy that is making eye contact with the viewer and so they're all singing and they're facing away but this one is singing making eye contact with you and um, I so I have there's water here and water in the background this is a horizon line and they're on a rock and I have most of them looking at, there's a ship really far off in the distance. And then I have um, this one and maybe this one too, but uh, only a few of them. There's, I want to have a, a ship that's really far off in the distance here. Um, this one probably would be harder to see. But I like the idea that there are two ships on the horizon that um, the group of them is mostly looking at one with a few looking at the other and since this one is making direct eye contact with the viewer uh, it's kind of like you're on a ship and so the viewer then forms a triangle with these these other two and so that's the initial sketch the initial idea that I have and so now I've been um, just going around and <laughs> playing with different groupings and I'm really focused on on that the siren that's facing towards us the viewer so I don't know what that is but I'm just going around and just trying to get different iterations different ideas of how the person could be or how they could all be posed I ended up um, really liking this where I like how the, the, the siren guy that's that's looking at the viewer is kind of propelling himself, pushing himself forward, and the the other two then are um, that are surrounded by this are behind him, which before in the original thing was the, the reversed. I liked how I had this um, I had this being a girl and this being a guy, but I liked how their bodies are 
mirroring each other with these bends of the spine that are kind of like encircling this figure. But um, I, now I, I really like how, how the, they're behind this guy and he's kind of really pushing forward. So I'm just getting different different ideas for how I can do this. Um, I started doing this with, I wanted there to be a tall figure and I like this idea with, um, this is the back and uh, this is so sloppy and just like, uh, I'm just kind of scribbling around, so I hope this is evident with what's going going on with the body, but having the, the arms and the elbows up, and he's kind of like just holding the back of his head, and um, if he's maybe more stretched up like how I have him in this one, I think that could be interesting for having him being um, a tall point in it, um, and I'm just messing around with different groupings. I like how, okay, so here how I'm having the bodies mirror each other and how the spines are touching. I really like how that looks. So um, the original thing that I like here, which I'm not keeping in the painting because I, I like how the, the guy looking at you is then pushed more forward um, instead of like these guys being directly in front of him. So I took this pose and then I just like, I like how the spines are mirroring. So I just like push the spines together then. And so they're facing away instead of at each other. Um, I don't know. I don't like this grouping either, and maybe having two figures mirroring each other so um, obviously is maybe distracting. So I don't know if I'm going to keep that or not. But um, I'm, what I'm trying to do also is just, I think that's, yeah, that's all I have. Um, trying to, they're all one group. But I want to have it like maybe like these are grouped together, these are grouped <laughs> together. So it's one one group, but kind of um, there's they can be broken up into groups beyond that. So that's what I'm doing so far with this one with this one painting. I'm really excited about it, um, and it might be something that might be I don't know. I want to. I'm, I'm thinking of stuff like to do after school that would kind of be. You know, not too far out of my comfort zone, but still making really interesting paintings. And this, because they're not clothed, and I feel like that would be similar to me doing my nude figures that I normally do. But then it's doing a lot of things that I'm not used to, which is figures that are interacting. And I want to have them interacting and not like they're just sitting. I want it to try and seem like maybe some of them have their arms around each other. It's evident that they're singing or like trying to, I don't know, something with our movements that they're trying to, you see that they're calling in these, these ships. Um, so I want there to be movement in the painting as well. Um, I've never painted rocks before and I want to have them on rocks. I've never um, done like a, I've done like little ocean, or not ocean, um, out my window of Lake Michigan. I've done little, little paintings like that, but nothing to this extent. And so, um, this other book that I was reading that I was talking about before, let me grab it. I can't find it, but it's called The Painter in Oil, and I really recommend it. Um, it has a lot of good advice and tips on how to study and then be making your own paintings. And so, um, there was a little section in, um, doing seascapes and saying that a lot of time you're not going to be having, especially if it's a big canvas, to be working outside looking at the ocean that you would do sketches and studies and then make your own um, or then work on the big, the final picture then in your studio and saying that when you're when you're studying water or also it, he was also relating this to clouds that since water is constantly moving, like clouds are constantly moving across the sky, instead of when you're painting them to be focusing on one particular wave of it's coming towards you or a cloud that's moving past you, but to um, try and let your eyes not focus on one thing and to just notice the patterns on how how the clouds are reacting and how they're moving, moving across the sky or like how the, the waves are moving and making patterns and then um, and then you can study one wave of, as it's coming forwards and how it changes and kind of like spreads out and just making a lot of sketches and studies of water or whatever you're doing like 
rocks because I'll have to do that as well for this painting um, until you start understanding the characteristic of them. So you're going for the characteristic rather than um, specific, like a one specific wave, which I think is helpful because definitely in this, um, I really like, I really enjoy working from life and I like how that looks in paintings. I think you, you can usually tell if someone's painting from photographs or from life or if they're blending the two. And um, I've worked, when I was in college, I worked strictly from photographs and I just don't think it's that fun for me. I, I guess I just more enjoy working from life anyway. So if I'm doing something like this, I would like to do a lot of studying of water and um, maybe boats and all of that to um, to try and make this painting. So I think so far I'm still working out the the figures, and I want to keep doing that and try and get different poses, um, and then I'll worry about the the sketches of maybe value sketches and color sketches and water and all that later. This video is all over the place. Um, I get back in school January 15th and so I'll be on my regular schedule again but now I'm just filling my time with things that I love. Painting, reading, and um, studying paintings.